All right, Razvan, thank you for joining me today for the latest uh, community conversation. And I think most of the D community probably knows who you are by now. If they don't, they must be living under a rock. But uh, let's uh, go ahead and and inform them anyway. Uh, who are you, Razvan, and why are you here today? Yeah, so thanks for the invitation, Mike. So I'm currently a pull request and issue manager for the D Language Foundation. And uh, yeah, most of the work that I've done in D revolves around the compiler inter internals. And yeah, I'm a hap I'm one of the happy programmers that uses D daily. <laughs> yeah, and I think your job now has gone well beyond the parameters of pull request and issue manager. And uh, we're going to get to that in just a little bit. But uh, why don't we start with your early forays into programming. When did you get the programming bug? When did it start for you and how? Uh, yeah, so I started uh, a bit late uh, during my first year of high school. Um, I saw the interview with Martin and I saw that I think he started in uh, middle school. Um, well, in Romania back then, not all people had computers. I was one of the lucky ones and I had one, but I mostly used it to play games. And it all seemed so magical. I couldn't understand how a small box basically was able to kind of produce all of those uh, uh, worlds that I was uh, playing in. And um, yeah, when I got to high, to high school, I got to a, it was called intensive programming class, right? So I had like seven or eight hours of programming a week. And we were basically trained to go to Olympiads and contests and stuff like that. And in a matter of two or three months, uh, I already participated to my first uh, contest. Uh, I didn't do uh, <laughs> very well, but still it was a start. And I remember being fascinated with, with the world of programming. Of course, my background was in mathematics. So switching from mathematics in, in middle school to uh, programming um it was it was really cool and I, I remember imagining myself being a programmer and going to work and doing all these cool programs and uh the fact that even by then uh people were expecting to have good salaries from being programmers so it was kind of best of both worlds it seemed like something that i would enjoy doing but also uh, get money from it and i just uh um you know went on, along with it so how did you get into D? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. So uh, during, uh, during uh, my university years, uh, I had a course on compilers. And yeah, it was a fascinating course. I was really into compilers. And we actually, uh, during the semester, we uh, had assignments to basically build our own compilers from our own compiler from scratch, Lexer, Parser, Code Generator, and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, I enjoyed very much doing that, but still, I kind of had the feeling that this toy language uh, doesn't really compare, you know, to uh, real languages out there. And two years later, while I was finishing my master's degree, uh, one of the professors at my university. Uh, so uh, for those of you who know, I'm from uh, Romania, from Bucharest. Uh, so one of the professors at my university told me that we're going to have this collaboration with uh, a person that at that point I had no idea who it is, which is Andrei Alexandrescu. And uh, yeah, he was presented as being this sort of legendary programmer. Uh, and he has his own language. Uh, and he's searching for some students that uh, can help him, you know, uh, develop the language further. And that that seemed like a, a great opportunity for me to delve into uh, the internals of a real compiler and see uh, how it's how it's like. And yeah, it was. I mean, the fundamentals of what I did in college were there, but it wasn't. Uh, an entirely different ball game, right? To to actually see the code of a real compiler, and uh, yeah. So the short answer to your question is through Andrei Alexandrescu, and if he's watching this, I I want to directly thank him for all of his guidance during those years. I think that if it weren't for Andrei, I don't know if I would actually got into the hang of uh, 
you know, understanding the DMD internals and doing the work that I'm doing today. So you, as I recall, your, your first real introduction to the D community was at uh, one of our Berlin D conferences. Um, I think it was what, was it 2016 or 2017? Uh, I think it was 2017. Yeah. I remember Andre brought like a, we, we called them the Romanian crew. <laughs> <laughs> you were, you were one of them. Did you give a, you gave a presentation, didn't you? At yes. Yes. And it was actually about DMD as a library. I remember being scared. It was one of the first times that I would talk in public on a technical aspect and knowing the caliber of uh, the D community. I was, yeah, it was awful. Even now, if I watch the video, uh, it almost makes me cry. I'm so ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was fine. Yeah, I, I, that's why I don't watch my old talks anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, so how did you uh, progress to... Um, I mean, were you uh, doing more contributions than just uh, working on DMD as a library? I mean, you were you were contributing to the compiler proper. Yeah, so it, it was kind of an interesting situation because uh, Andre, although he uh, knows a lot of things, he didn't actually do too much uh, uh, DMD internals uh, mm -hmm. developing, right? So. Uh, he knew like all of the principles, but he didn't have uh, hands-on experience with the actual code base. Although he helped me in many situations, there were a lot of situations where, um, yeah, I wanted to implement something or uh, maybe fix a bug. And Andre would tell me, you know, this, this, this needs to happen somewhere. This is the behavior that we want. Uh, but it would, it would still be like very, very complicated to kind of find the actual code that was interesting that I had to modify. And at that time, I didn't really have a person that I could actually ask. I mean, of course, you could put some questions in the forums or maybe uh, have some discussions on your pull requests. But most of the time, you would have to like dig in and investigate. And yeah, I would spend like a lot of hours reading the code and, you know, putting printfs and trying to understand what what happens over there but eventually uh you know you start to understand what's going on there you start to know the code base and everything becomes much more much easier right so uh yeah i started like doing some refactorings with uh, uh dmd as a library but also then i started fixing bugs yeah so uh fixing bugs was, was a good way for me to kind of uh, tackle all of the parts of the compiler Mm -hmm. And yeah, my first real project, my first contribution was implementing the copy constructor. Mm. So I had to write a dip, uh, which Andre helped me with. And then I had to actually implement it all by my, all by myself. And yeah, that was, uh, that was a massive experience for me. I got to learn a lot of, mm. a lot of things. Well, did you have, and, uh, no, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. Go. Well, I was going to yeah, say, did I, you? <laughs> 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 Please, you go ahead. <laughs> yeah, the only thing that I wanted to add was that after a few years, uh, when I felt that uh, I had more confidence with working with a code base, I started like picking up students and then just uh, uh, trying to mentor them. Because even right now, the DMD code base doesn't really have too many, too many contributors. It's just like the old ones, Walter, myself, Dennis, um, Ian, um, and yeah, another uh, of another few folks, but it's just basically the same gang since I don't know three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to ask you in those early days of your contributions, did you have a lot of interactions with Walter? Um, well, he he used to uh, give me feedback on some of my pull requests, but I would say that not that much. Mm -hmm. uh, Andre was encouraging me to. Uh, contact Walter on specific issues, but, um, and I remember, I think we had a call uh, where we discussed a bit on templating the parser to, to uh, basically further DMD as a library, to advance DMD as a library, but uh, yeah, we didn't have too many interactions. 
mm. I would say. I don't know. Like, I think in part it was because I was also kind of a bit intimidated about him to try to contact him. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we didn't we didn't have too many interactions. I don't well, really I mean, know. On the plus side, I mean, that means you weren't screwing things up badly. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think there were some occasions where, uh, because of, I, because of my lack of experience, I tried to do some some patches that were maybe not so great. But uh, back then, there were other people like Matthias Lang, and there was also Yeblis. I think mm. was his nickname on on GitHub. Daniel Murphy. Mm. Yeah, Daniel Murphy, and even Stefan Koch. They were mm -hmm. more uh, they were more active back then, and they would basically review my pull requests. There was also mm -hmm. Sebastian Wilsbach, but he was more on the Phobos side, not as much on, on the DMD side. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, I mean, there, there were people that, that gave me very good uh, uh, reviews, and uh, I could learn from them a lot of things. So you started your... Um summer school at the university was it was that that was before you started working uh in the uh, pr manager role wasn't it or was that after yes that yes i think the first edition was in 2018 right so how did that uh, come about um well uh back then i was uh, uh Edward Staniloy was also working on some project and we were very happy. We were learning a lot of things. We had the school projects, but, uh, and people would ask us about like We were both PhD students and they would ask like, oh, so, so what are you doing? Oh, we're working for this uh, language, D language. And most of the time, nobody heard about the D language. And we were, we had to explain a lot and tell everybody, uh, you know, like, <clears throat> What, what D language is all about. And then we participated in a couple of DCOMFs. And I think every time people were asking themselves, like, what can we do to further popularize the language? And of course, everyone has, has you know, their own opinion about that. And we started wondering, like, we are not very important in this community. We are still like PhD students. We haven't worked in uh, major corporations, but still, is there anything we can do to, you know, popularize the language? and one thing um, we were doing was uh, we were teaching all sorts of uh, you know courses or seminars or labs and of course operating systems and different uh, kinds of uh, subjects um, and yeah we had an audience and we thought maybe there is some sort of way we can uh, you know present D to all of these students and maybe in time um, if sufficient students are going to have on their CV you know I know the D language. Maybe at some point corporations will notice that, or if you have students that are very passionate about a particular language and they end up working in some sort of, uh, of corporation, then maybe they they will push for uh, the D language. Uh, now thinking about it, it seemed like such a naive perspective, but you never know, right? So we just wanted to kind of do something so that uh, um, students have. Uh, know about the existence of D early on, and if they like the language, why not? Maybe they use it for personal projects or they push it at their companies. Like that, that was our initial thought. Then we realized that if you have some students that you know know the language, then we can also do all sorts of projects with them. We can introduce them to the community. We can maybe make them apply for a symmetry item of code, or they can pick up some projects that are interests uh, that are of interest for the foundation. Yeah, and you're still running that summer school, yeah? That's still going on? Uh, well, uh, for the past two years, we didn't run it because um, our university went through some sort of reorganization uh, and they were searching for new courses and we managed to push this, uh, this D course or this course that is based on D. We actually call it Secure Programming. Um and basically, it's now an optional course at our university, and it's oh, held see. every two years. Yeah, it, it, it's a weird program. So, but yeah, every two years, uh, myself and Eddie, we just um, we just teach this course, which, which is about D. That's it's cool. basically that's, D. That's cool. Yeah. So it's gone from just a, a summer school thing into a real course. Um, 
And you did mention SEOC, and that was going to be my next question because the summer school program that you had actually brought in a few uh, students into SEOC. And I, you have been a, a mentor uh, because of that uh, in the SEOC events. Uh, you, you, our first SEOC was in 2018. You weren't involved with that one, correct? Uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah, probably 2019 was your first one? Or 2020? Yeah. 2019? Yeah, yeah, that was that was when you mentored when you started mentoring, and you've been mentoring in every SEAC since then. Um, sometimes uh, more than one participant. You've been. I know this year you had two. Uh, so, can you tell me uh, a little bit about the the SEAC experience uh, from your perspective as a as a mentor? Um. Yeah. So SEAC was something that. Uh, uh, really went hand in hand with our, our summer school program. So um, at our university, students, they have a lot of summer schools that, that uh, they can pick from. And yeah, I mean, you can go to all of them, but most students, they want to go to some summer schools, but they also want to have some vacation. And also we were targeting third year uh, students, which they also have to go do an internship during the summer. So the, we had a lot of competition, right? And uh, sadly, the D summer school wasn't like the most popular one. We also had like a sec uh, security summer school, which was very popular because one of uh, one of the professors from our university held it and he had like more popularity. But um, having SEOC was like a big motivator, right? Because how we marketed ourselves, we're like not only you're going to learn this Greek language, but uh, at the end, uh, the best participants, uh, we can help them apply for, for SEOC, right? And you get the chance to work for a real life project that's, uh, that's basically an entity is going to benefit from it. You're going to do real work and you're also going to get some money. So yeah, that was like our main differentiator because the other summer schools, uh, you know, you finish the summer school and that's that. You gain some knowledge and then it's up to you how you use it but here not only that you're gaining knowledge but you also have the opportunity to use it in a real life project and you're going to get paid for it so i felt that that was like a, our main differentiator and you know we've had ups and downs like for our first edition i think we had 20 participants and then during uh, the covid when it was online and we basically so we had this sort of entrance assignment, right? If you wanted to participate to the summer school, you would have to uh, do some sort of assignment in C++, and then we would choose the best assignments and, and whatever. But then during the second year, uh, we just said like, everyone who wants to, partici to participate, you can just participate because it's going to be online. So we don't have any uh, logistical constraints. And I think we had 80 participants. It was like the biggest success. Of course, as the school progressed, uh, some people, you know, they abandoned the school, but still, I think we managed to have like 50 people uh, to the end. So, yes. yeah, yeah, Symmetry, Symmetry Atom of Code was uh, was really great for us in that regard. Yeah, and um, we're really thankful for Sym Symmetry to uh, continue running that. Uh, there's no plans to stop it. It's going to keep going. Um, I should be announcing the 2024 edition uh, later this year. Um, and uh, yeah, for those who haven't heard, Symmetry Autumn of Code is a, it's inspired by the Google Summer of Code and um, Symmetry uh, approached us about this uh, in, in 2018 and it was a great idea. They, they are funding the whole thing and it's been, we've had some successful projects come out, come out of it. And several of them have been from your former students. Uh, and uh, I know we've had one, uh, Teo, Teodor Dutu has uh, been working on um, converting uh, D runtime hooks into templates for three years now, I think. He's participated in three SEOCs working on that project. And he's coming to the end, I think, isn't he? He's, he's getting close to the end of it. And uh, he was our prize winner, I guess, uh, if, if you want to call it a winner uh, for two years. Yeah, that's that's been very successful, uh, successful collaboration there. Um, so now let's uh, get back to the core team stuff. So you you went from being a, a, a contributor to the compiler 
and to teaching D into becoming a member of the core team as a pull request and issue manager. Now, I should mention also this was uh, thanks to Symmetry Investments. They provided the funding for two pull requests and issue managers, and you were one of the applicants, and you got uh, got the job. How did you get into that? What what uh, what was the thinking process behind applying and accepting? Um, yeah, so it was uh, kind of interesting because um, during uh, 2020, I was doing an internship in Singapore. And until uh, 2020, I was actively contributing to D and working on projects under the guidance of Andrea Alexandrescu. Um, but uh, in 2019, I think, uh, uh, during that decomp, Andre announced that he's going to step down from, uh, from uh, uh, being one of the co-maintainers of D. And um, yeah, up until that point, I was working directly with him. We had like this weekly calls and he would, uh, uh, you know, he would manage me and tell me you should work on this, you should work on this. And uh, how things were was that I was also like taking a pause from D to focus on uh, finishing my PhD. So during 2020, uh, I was, I, I, I would come back to Romania. So uh, during 2020, I focused on entirely different things, but um, what, when the year was ending, I was kind of thinking like, okay, now I'm going to go back to Romania. Uh, what am I going to do? How is, how is my relationship uh, with D going to, to look like? What am I going to work on? And yeah, as it happened, uh, you announced on the forums that there's going to be a paid position for the, and that just, that was just perfect. It was exactly <laughs> what, what, uh, what I need. I mean, um, I was still intending to contribute, but I also had to like kind of find a source of, uh, of money, right? I wanted to also, uh, uh, you know, get higher than, uh, have some sort of financial uh, source. Um, yeah, and, and it was ideal. It was a part-time job. I could also, also like, uh, uh, focus a bit on the research that I was doing, but still kind of, uh, keep, uh, a touch with, uh, with the foundation. And yeah, I think that also the financial aspect is a bit important because, um, the students that I've had, uh, that participated the symmetry autumn of code uh, or maybe did some projects for their bachelor or uh, dissertation um you know after they finish uh university they also have to you know work and get mm -hmm. some money and even though they like working for d and contributing the fact that they're not getting some sort of revenue stream for that it's it's a bit problematic because yeah, in the D community, uh, people are very, you know, self-motivated. They can go to work and program and then during their spare time, spend some time on their hobby projects. But I think that most programmers are not like that. Hmm. Or what I'm seeing at our university, when they finish university, they get a very well-paid job and maybe they're stressed at their job or they're doing all the work. And when they have some spare time, they choose to, you know, spend it with their family or, hmm. uh, you know, just some, some other fun things. And uh, that's what also happened to our students. Like we had like some successful projects. I would try to kind of, you know, make them apply to a PhD or maybe apply to a master's degree and delay getting, uh, getting hired just so that I can, you know, uh, I can work with them and advance the D projects. Uh, but most of the times they just want, you know, to go and have some industry experience um so so yeah I, I mean it would be great i know that the foundation and as things stand maybe uh we cannot pay contributors or something like that but uh for these students they need to have like some sort of motivation and also to 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 get some money so um yeah i don't know exactly what the what the solution is here but I feel that I forgot what the question was. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about how you came to apply for the PR and issue manager job. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is just a small detour because for me things worked out perfectly. But uh, yeah, my students and maybe other people are not are not that lucky. 
Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, I, I also felt that I was very qualified for the job because I've been working for at the compiler for four years at that time. And I felt that I knew the code base pretty well. I also had some contributions to Phobos and, and D runtime. Mm -hmm. But uh, being a part time job and also having a partner in this uh, helps a lot. Yeah. And uh, that was going to be my next question because there were two positions, two part time positions for this. I, I believe. The initial concept was one full-time position or two part-time positions, and we ended up filling the two part-time positions. But the other candidate ended up never taking on uh, the the role. He wanted to take some time to, to to get up to speed, and then it just it just never happened. And so you ended up working for that first year, I believe, twenty twenty one. You ended up working yeah. by yourself on this, yeah. and so yeah. How how was that? I mean, basically. The job definition was, okay, your job is to manage our pull requests and our issues, you know, review pull requests and, you know, make sure issues get fixed. But that was basically it. There was no, you know, list of tasks for you to say, oh, this is what you're supposed to do in this role. You had to basically create the position from scratch. So how did you approach it in, in that first year by yeah, yourself? So in, yeah, initially it was very important for me to um, give the attention that's necessary for each pull request because it was a long-standing issue in our community that you know pull requests they're not getting the attention they deserve and a lot of people get frustrated because they put in the time to uh, you know do the work but then um, their pull requests are being ignored and. Uh, yeah, so uh, a big part of what I was doing initially in, in the first year was to just, you know, make sure that every time a pull request is, is being made, I comment on it, I try to, you know, review it myself. If I don't have the expertise, then maybe ping uh, people that have uh, the necessary expertise to review it. I'm not saying that that worked perfectly all the time because there were situations in which, you know, I didn't. I didn't know if the patch was uh, was right or wrong, but I tried to find people that could review it, and maybe I also failed at that. And at that point, I just I was just like, you know, I don't know what to do with it. It seems that there are aren't any other people that could uh, that uh, could review it. So we're basically in a stalemate. I hope you don't mind, fellow contributor. Uh, in other situations, I would just you know take a look at it and if it seemed that it's not doing anything obviously wrong, I would just merge it because sometimes I feel that if you don't have like a strong argument to not accept something, maybe it's better just to just to accept the contribution. Of course, every rule has, every rule has exceptions, but yeah, you just have to judge depending on the situation. And um, yeah, I don't know if people have the impression that every day, uh, you know, the language gets like 20 or 30 pull requests that are extremely important. Well, that, that doesn't really happen. Like most of the times pull requests really tackle like a minor aspect of the language or the library. And uh, you can, I mean, your average reviewer can review it. You don't need Walter or some someone who is super specialized in that thing to, to review it. So yeah, this was like one aspect of the job. I was very, I was adamant about making contact with the uh, with the pull request with the pull request as fast as possible. And the other aspect that I focused on was uh, fixing issues. And fixing issues is again a pain point in our community because people complain very often that uh, you know issues are not getting fixed. And I don't know what the solution to that was, but what I could do is you know go through the list. And whenever I see issues that I know how to solve, I would just uh, put in a pull request and that's that. So that was kind of my main focus during the first year. Then in the second year, when, when Dennis also uh, came on board, uh, yeah, uh, I, I had more time to kind of, you know, focus on other contributions, right? Yeah, to yes. So, so I, I want to get the, the way I want to go there is, you know, Dennis came on board uh, at the end of 2021. We, we, decided yes. to try to fill that empty position. So he came in and he started in 2022. So now you have a partner and how did your process change? Um, well, initially I remember we tried to kind of have like these weekly meetings 
to kind of discuss what the plan is going to be, but that didn't really work out. I don't, I mean, I remember we tried two or three times, but we didn't really have anything to discuss or debate because it was fairly straightforward. Mm -hmm. uh, Dennis also understood that uh, basically the job is to make sure that people are not frustrated with pull requests and basically review pull requests and fix issues. So there wasn't really much to, to talk about. And um, yeah, we also had like the, the, our weekly meetings, right? The three of us and yeah. The three of us being, of, being you two and me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. When, when did we start uh, those? Do you remember? Was that uh, 2022 or? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, we, I think we, uh, myself and you, we were having these meetings even before. Ah, uh, before Dennis came in. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then Dennis came in and we just continued like meeting the three of us. And since Dennis came in, your responsibilities have basically expanded quite a bit. You're, you're doing quite a bit more than fixing issues and pull requests. Dennis started implementing unimplemented dips like the named arguments, yeah. he worked on that one for quite a while. And you've continued to focus on DMD as a library. So why why is that in, in your lap? Why did why did that get on your plate? Well, I think, you know, I start, this was like the first project that I had when uh, contributing to D. Mm -hmm. And I think that at this point, among the contributors that are still active, I have kind of, I mean, not the most knowledge, but I've been working the most on this project, right? So there were other contributors in the past, like uh, uh, Jacob Karlborg, um, even Petar, Petar Kirov, and uh, even in in the first DCOMs, I, I discussed with them about DMD as a library. So I feel that at this moment, I am the person who has been talking to most of the people that, you know, had skin in the skin in the game with regards to DMD as a library. So I know the history, the entire history of uh, what the what decisions have been made, uh, what things have been tried and didn't work out. Um, also, I, I've been having students working on all sorts of projects to use DMD as a library. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of my, you know, sole project. <laughs> mm -hmm. And also, uh, I also have the knowledge for it. it. Well, I know that one of the things you're doing right now to facilitate that project is a refactoring of the AST notes. Now, you talked about this at DCOF. Uh, Last year, I believe, right? Last year, was, that was what your talk was about. And before this interview goes out, we'll be publishing a blog post that you've written asking for help with uh, your current work on this project. Can you go ahead and talk about that a little bit right now? Yeah, so um, essentially, when we started work on DMDS library, when I started working on this, basically DMDS library didn't exist. I mean, you had GDC and LDC using the DMD front end, but uh, we didn't have, you know, uh, uh, the infrastructure to build a compiler as a library. We didn't even know like what the interface should be like. You, of course, you had the functions and GDC and LDC are using them, but uh, we didn't really think about, you know, what's the sort of interface that the uh, tool developer needs? What's the type of information that, that they need? And uh, at that point, we uh, uh, took a look what, at what LLVM is doing, you know, with, with its compiler library, and we tried to mimic it. Um, but we wanted, you know, to have the compiler code base uh, uh, share the library code base, right? So we don't, you know, uh, do modifications in, in two code bases at once. So at that point, it seemed like what we needed to do is to have a clear separation between uh, uh, the compilation phases, like lexing, parsing, semantic analysis, and optimizations, and so on and so forth. Uh, but it it turned out that that's not that you couldn't do that because the way the compiler is designed, if you import a bunch of files, you end up importing the entirety of the compiler code base, right? So it was very hard to 
to separate this. Um, and even at that point, uh, Jacob Karlberg, Petar Kirov, uh, even Yeblis, I think, they were on the side, you know, we need to kind of pull out all of the semantic information out of AST notes. That's the way to go. And, and I agreed with that. But it seemed that there was so much work on this. And uh, yeah, you had to shuffle a lot of code uh, from one file to the other. And Walter was adamantly against this, right? So uh, it seemed that, that there was no way we can progress uh, with, with, with our goal. Um, so then Matthias came with the idea, like, why don't we just try to use uh, the library for existing projects? Like, you know, you have libdparse, which is a parcel implementation, a third-party parcel implementation, and that uh, uh, library is being used by, by uh, other tool creators. Like, why not just try to use uh, DMD over there and see what uh, DMD has a library and see uh, what the interface should look like, and uh, that was a that was actually a great idea, and I started doing that with all sorts of students. But the thing is that we were only using parsing information uh, there. We we didn't really try to uh, come up with an interface um, that basically lets you use the semantic information of the AST. And I don't want to get too much in the technical details, but it really seemed that. It, it, it turns out that you have to separate the semantic information from the AST nodes. Uh, that's, that's the only way we can actually move, for, move uh, forward and have like a good compiler as a library. Of course, there are other ways in which you can work around this, but we really want to have like a clean interface and a clean code base. And that's just, that just needs to happen. And the good part is it's not difficult work. It's not complex work. It's really easy to do. It's just that it's a lot of work, right? Mm. And for people out there that want to familiarize them, themselves with the compiler code base, I feel that this is really a great opportunity. Oh, great. So by the time this video is out uh, and around the time this video is is published, uh, it it's probably won't be true a year down the road, but uh, there is a blog post and uh, some guidelines uh, about this and I'll link them in the description so you can see it. But you did mention um, using the library and existing projects. And I believe there were two SAOC projects for this. One was for libdparse and the other one was for dformat. Was, is that right? Is my memory correct? Uh, yeah. So there is, uh, there is one. Yes. So in the past, there was one symmetry atom of code project. It was uh, uh, Lucian Danesco. So he was working on uh, using the MDs as a library for D scanner. D scanner, so I guess, that's it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Our viewers know about D scanner, which is currently using libdparse to mm -hmm. uh, parse the code and create an AST and to uh, uh, apply some sort of passes on that AST to kind of, uh, uh, you know, implement all sorts of linting rules. Um, and yeah, Lucian managed to do like half of the work that is needed to fully replace libdparse. And now I'm having another student uh, that didn't participate to Symmetry Autumn of Code, but this uh, is trying to take this project to the finish line for, for his uh, uh, bachelor degree. I see. Hmm. Yeah. And the other project is, yes, using uh, DMD as a library for D format. And yeah, recently, a lot of people have been talking about, you know, integrating in the compiler D format or mm -hmm. uh, specific passes. Like, for example, if you have a deprecation, you can just, you know, instruct the compiler to fix the deprecation for you. So basically integrating D format with the compiler would be a plus in that side. And once you deprecate something, you are, you would also be forced to implement, uh, let's say, a, a formatting pass that mm -hmm basically lets the compiler uh, you know fix the deprecation for you and we, we've been talking about all kinds of changes to the compiler like making it a, a daemon and uh, integrating an LSP uh, server to it so that the compiler is always running in the background and uh, what what are your what are your thoughts on on this uh yeah, I have participated in some discussions and I agree that this should this is a goal that we should have, but given the current state of the code base, um, 
there's a lot of work that needs to be done and also it really depends to what degree you want to implement the you know the lsp you know the language server protocol because essentially an lsp has basically two components you know there's uh basically let's say the networking part where you have a client and the server and basically the client just gives you some code and the server you know compiles it uh, extracts some information and then sends it back to the client Mm -hmm. And this part, uh, there are already tools that are implementing this, like ServeD, and there was another tool, but I, I forget its name right now. I think it was implemented by, so ServeD is implemented by Jan, mm -hmm. and WebFreak, for those who maybe don't know him. And the other one is, uh, I forget its name, but I think it's implemented by Rainers. Um, but then there's... Uh, the actual capabilities of the of you know the, the compiler demo like what it can do and to a certain degree I think that with some work uh, DMD as a library could be used as a as a drop-in replacement for whatever uh, serve D is using but for example stuff like incremental compilation the way the the way DMD is implementing right now, I would say that we are very far from that goal. And actually, mm -hmm. I even have trouble imagining like what sort of changes we would need to apply to the code base to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But all of this discussion, however, is very good for uh, the compiler as a library, right? Because either way, uh, we are going to make some progress, right? If our long-term long goal is, uh, you know, LSP, that's fine. We still have to adjust our interface, we still have to modify the code base to uh, be able to, you know, uh, store all of the information that's needed. And actually, even last week, I had a very productive discussion with Walter and, and Jan, and it seems that we are all, you know, uh, aligning our thoughts and our objectives. And I'm really hopeful that maybe by the end of this year, we're going to see like some, some massive improvements for the compiler library. Yeah, you know, it's been really interesting watching Walter's uh thoughts on this uh, evolve over time. I know Robert, Robert Shattuck was, was really, you know, hammering on that idea of a built-in LSP server and on, you know, automatic compilation of, of your source code as you're typing, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, get building up a, a development ecosystem for the modern, you know, developer uh, instead of the old dinosaurs, you know. So I think uh, you know, watching Walter uh, evolve on this stuff has been really interesting because he's he's uh, behind a lot of it now, uh, accepting it. Uh, so that's that's pretty cool. Um, what are you, if anything? I mean, is there anything about our uh, recent meetings and discussions about our future plans? Is there anything that you're really excited about? And looking uh, forward to well, I'm, yeah. I uh, uh, personally, I'm really excited about uh, all of this movement around compiler as a library. Mm -hmm. um, you know, three or four years back, I was kind of the only person sometimes talking about this. Like people, I mean, of course, uh, you know, you would see on the forums people complaining uh, for the lack of tools, but there wasn't really discussion at the you know at the foundation level about what we do to kind of progress. Mm -hmm. uh, on this, but uh, right now I'm I'm really glad that this has is becoming an opportunity uh, is becoming uh, you know a priority. Mm -hmm. Like we are discussing about this at our meetings. Uh, I'm having students that are working and making progress on this, and yeah, the next step at least for me would be to you know the broader community to be implicated in this. Uh, by actually, you know, working on this or maybe participating to the discussions on like what, what the interface should look like and basically everyone being aware about uh, the progress on, on, on this project. And for me, that, that that's really great. About the other things that we are discussing, those kind of are in, in, you know, on second place for me, like with the discussion with editions and safe by default. And mm -hmm. I, I'm not particularly affected uh, as a user of D, I'm not affected that much. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, DMD as a library, I have skin in the game. So yeah, the way things are have been working out in uh, the past six months, uh, that that that's really great from my side. Yeah, I just realized as I'm ask as I asked you about that that I'm way behind on my uh, up 
up my meeting summaries and planning updates. Uh, I got to catch everybody up on the things we've been we've been discussing. Um, great. So, uh, our, I just announced the. I, I just made the preliminary announcement for Deconf twenty four. Uh, it's preliminary because I, I haven't gotten final confrontation. Uh, confrontation. <laughs> final confirmation about the uh, the the venue contract as of this moment. But I, I don't expect any issues. I expect it's going to be going forward September seventeenth to twentieth. Are you uh, thinking of uh, submitting anything this year? Uh, yes, it's probably. Uh it's it's become a tradition that I talk about the MDS library. So I'm <laughs> hoping that yeah, we're gonna have like some major some major progress on that front. Mm -hmm. So yeah, my hope is that I'm going to be able to present what has been done in the past year and also present like plans and what are my what my ideas are for, for uh future projects. Mm. Would you give any advice or uh, encouragement, words of wisdom to anybody who is uh, thinking of, would like to submit a, a talk to D DCONF, but uh, are hesitant to do so for some reason? I know a lot of people are in that position. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm not going to lie. If this is the first time that you're going to present in, in, in public, it's probably going to be more or less of a nightmare before you actually go on stage, <laughs> but it's really worth it. it. It's really, really worth it. And you know, the satisfaction that you feel once you are able to actually deliver a talk and see that people are actually interested in what you are working on. I think it's really, really worth it. And keep in mind that uh, people are very friendly. So nobody is going to, you know, judge you very harshly. And, uh, yeah, if you want to get some encouragement, you can just walk my first talk from 2017, which was awful, <laughs> and I survived that, and I submit it again. So, um, yeah, if I if if I survive, then definitely you will also do. You will also be able to. So, yeah, we we've had uh, a lot of first time not only decomp speakers but first time public speakers at the last couple of editions, more a couple of editions, more more than usual. And uh, that's uh, been r really nice to see. Uh, but what is your favorite part of, of DCOF? What keeps you coming back every year? I mean, well, aside from being a member of the core team, and you get free registration. So what's, the, <laughs> <laughs> what's what keeps you coming back? Yeah, I, I think for me, I'm also a, a very sociable person, and I I like to you know discuss. Um, all of my ideas or other people's ideas in person. And yeah, uh, a, a few years back, there was someone that said that, you know, you're wasting a lot of money with this uh, physical meeting. You should, we should just do like only online conferences because it's much cheaper and use that money for something else. Uh, well, I don't agree with that view. I think that meeting in person is really really great and being able to uh you know discuss your ideas over a couple of beers uh that that's like the most uh fun aspect for me and also if you want to further your agenda with regards to a specific pull request or maybe a specific language feature uh, basically everyone who has a say in what happens to the language is going to be there. So mm. if you come to the conference, you basically maximize your chances of, uh, you know, furthering your agenda. So uh, in my opinion, these are, or for me, these are the two reasons why uh, uh, coming to, uh, to DCONF is a must. And uh, we're going to wrap up here in just a minute, but I, I just have a couple more questions to close this out. And the first one, relates to contributors uh, in, in your current role as the pull request and issue manager, you're also kind of the de facto uh, interface with contributors. Now I know you have some help in the PR reviews, like from Nicholas Wilson and I guess Petr Kirov and some other people, they, they do uh, reviews uh, and they do a good job of it. And uh, we, we absolutely thank them for that. Uh, but what are your, uh, what advice do you have to anyone who's, um, interested in contributing to the compiler or to Phobos or, you know, any of any of our other core projects, what, what advice would you give them to, to get going? And uh, where do you think 
the most impactful work is right now? Um, I first, I think that contributing to an open source project is really, really complicated. Um, we've been trying to encourage students at our university to do it. And it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of babysitting from our side to, you know, help them up with uh, installing the tools, getting the code base, compiling stuff and so on and so forth. And um, of course, there are also some very, 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 very good programmers that they can just do it like easily, you know, but um, I know that if it's a if it's a bit hard and it makes you feel frustrated, you maybe start having these thoughts that you know maybe I'm not uh, such a such a good programmer and maybe it's not for me. But uh, I beg to differ. So if you want to contribute, indeed you you have to have some patience. But that's why uh, me and Dennis and maybe others in the community are here. So we are here to help. Right? So if you have some time, if you're interested in learning something, if you want to contribute, uh, feel free to contact us at any time. Uh, use the forums, use Slack, use Discord. There are going to be people there that, that can help you. So if you want to contribute, I think this is an important aspect because, of course, yeah, there's going to be, you know, like the, the cowboy programmers that they can just, you know, get any code base and contribute and do a great job and whatnot, but I think that the majority of programmers, if they uh, if they feel that they're not alone in this, they can also do, do a great job. So yeah, that my advice would be have patience and also don't, don't uh, be afraid to ask questions and contact the right people. Um, <clears throat> and now with regards to work that is impactful, you know, when you first start doing contributions, it's really hard to do, you know, you're not going to implement a language feature like for your first pull request, or I mean, maybe you are, but that's a very rare uh, case. So you have to start, you, you, you have to start small. And uh, the contributor guideline that you are going to, to publish, I think is a very, it's actually a great place to start. And it's really impactful work. I mean, it's going to help the MDS library immensely if people are going to uh, start doing all of those refactorings. And it's also simple work and I can help with that. Um, now, there might be other aspects and other projects where they can contribute, but unfortunately, I don't really know the details and some of them actually seem complicated, like thinking about our priorities. Uh, and when I say our, I think about the D Language Foundation. There are a lot of projects that are fairly complicated and I don't know if you know your average contributor can just uh, pick them up and do a pull request and <laughs> implement mm -hmm. whatever it's important for us but we have a lot of low hanging fruit things uh, in the field of refactoring or you know doing documentation documentation is also extremely important and um, yeah you can have like a major contribution there uh, but what I'm trying to stress out is if you plan on contributing, it's best that you contact someone from the foundation first to, to uh, get some, some guidance. And I mean, I don't know if other people in the foundation are willing to do so, but I definitely am. And I think that Dennis also is. So uh, our job is to kind of basically be the interface, right, to the foundation. So everything you want to discuss, anything you want to propose, anything you need, you need help with, it would be great if you could just contact us. And my next question then is about issues. And I occasionally see somebody encounters a, a bug and then somebody else finds it in Bugzilla and they're like, oh my God, this has been sitting there for eight years. How could it have been open for so long without being fixed? Uh, what are you going to say to somebody in that situation? I've just stumbled across a bug. It's, it's eight years old, seven years old. Um, what do I do? Yeah, the fact that the bug is old doesn't necessarily mean that uh, we have failed as an organization, right? We have currently in DMD around 3,000 bugs. Some of them are 15 years old, right? And the matter of fact is that we are a, a handful of people and we need to, you know, fix bugs, review pull requests, implement language features, uh, respond to questions on the, for to questions on the forums, 
uh, organize ourselves, have discussions. We need to have like, you know, we need to do tons of things. And yes, sometimes some some bugs are going to be slipped under the rug. So um, I'm not saying, I, 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 I mean, I'm just explaining why things are they are. Because ideally we would like to fix all of those bugs. But yeah, sometimes sometimes we just don't have the time for it. So you just need to have patience with us. Um, the other thing is um, you should always bring the bugs that are important for you in our attention. Even if you bring it once and uh, yeah, maybe you fail to uh, attract the attention it needs, just try it again another time. Just uh, you know, go on the forums, uh, go on Slack uh, and eventually sometimes someone is going to, to get it fixed. But typically, if you have a bug which is eight years old and hasn't been fixed since then, it's probably because nobody, uh, you know, brought it brought it to our attention in that time. Yeah, and I guess I'll also put in that you know, if anybody does encounter that kind of situation, just you know, email me, and you know, I'll push it to to Razvan and Dennis, and uh, maybe uh, they can. Uh, resolve it somehow or find somebody who can, I guess that's a, a, another option. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you do see bugs that are, uh, important to you, yeah, don't, don't, don't just be quiet about it. Say something. <laughs> yeah. We, we've got our ears open these days. There was a while, uh, uh, there was a time when you could shout about a bug in the forums and it wouldn't get fixed, but those days are, are pretty much gone. I think, uh, with, with Razon and Dennis on the job, if uh, somebody brings it to their attention, they will eventually get it resolved if possible. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's good advice. Razan. So, yeah, um, no. Oh, go ahead. One thing I, I would like to add, uh, also there are some limitations with the Bugzilla system, right? So basically if an issue was reported, you know, uh, <laughs> 10 years ago and people see that issue and nobody complains about it, there's no, there's no way we can know which issues are important and not. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have the severity, but that's uh, misused most of the time. So uh, now with the that we're having the plans to migrate from uh, uh, Bugzilla to GitHub, uh, we're going to have like other features that can maybe give us a hint on what issues are important. Cause mm -hmm. you can, you know, uh, like issues, dislike issues. You can, I don't know, comment on them and stuff like, stuff like that. So yeah, yeah. I think that the rule here is if you have pressing issues, just make a fuss about them and yeah. eventually they'll get fixed. Yeah. Yep, that's pretty much it. So is there uh, anything you would like to say to the D community at large before we wrap up our conversation? Um, well, just that uh, I, I'm always reading the forums and uh, I don't really participate that much, but I read them all the time. And um, sometimes I can feel that people are, are being frustrated and with, I don't know what, what's happening, the direction of the language or that the specific bug is not fixed and, um, fairly quickly the discussion, you know, is, uh, being flipped on the side that, you know, D is mismanaged, uh, D isn't going in the proper direction and, uh, you know, all other negative things. And from my perspective, I know that, I mean, I know it can be fr frustrated at times. I know that things maybe don't go in the direction that you are hoping uh, them to go. Uh, but you should also keep in mind that we are only a handful of people and everyone is doing their best and everyone, you know, has, are trying to do like what they think is best and we are trying to democratize the process. So I just hope that People have patience and they're not so critical because uh, most of the time people really, really mean well for the, mm -hmm. and well yeah, said. that's all. Yeah. All right, Razvan, thank you for taking the time to do this today. I really appreciate it. And uh, I mean, you and I already talk once a week pretty much as it is. So, but this is the first time I've 
you know, had this really uh, in-depth conversation with you about this, and I'm I'm really glad that you were agreed to do it in public. So that's great. Thank you so, for uh, inviting yeah, me. No problem. That was uh, that was a great time. And uh, for those of you uh, in the audience, uh, I will see you again uh, in. March, the, the last weekend of March. And, but before then, we're going to be having DCOF online. It's a one day event this year, March 16th, which is a Saturday. And we'll be running that in a live stream right here on our YouTube channel. So uh, thanks for watching and I will see you next time. Bye bye.